And good evening, Westbury Church of Christ. Wednesday, September the 9th, 2020, we're in a series on faith, specifically how to have the faith to do what we want to accomplish in the course of our lifetimes. Now, God gives us circumstances in life so that we can learn to know him better, and he allows problems and pressures and difficulties and all kinds of those situations so that we can come to know him better. God has a very specific plan. I'm going to call it a very well thought out plan for our lives, for your life and for my life. And if we don't understand the process of how God works, we're going to miss out on the plan. And if we miss out, we're going to miss out on what we were put on this earth to do. So we have a choice. We can choose to do what, to, to go our own way, or we can choose to cooperate with God. Now, here's how we learn how to cooperate with God. Every dream that we have, every idea, every goal that we have goes through six different phases from start to finish. I call them the six phases of faith. There is dream. That's where you have a goal. That's where you have an idea. That's where, here's what I want to do with my life. And then a decision. And this is where, this is changes it. It's going from the, here's my dream to how do we make it work. And then delay seems like it's not going to ever come happen for us. And then difficulty. It seems like people throw up obstacles to get us further away from our goal as opposed to closer to our goal. And then, and then dead end. And that's where our dreams have gone away. We don't have our dreams anymore. It seems like they have been absolutely and utterly smashed and left us, which then brings us to deliverance. And, uh, and that's where God comes through for us and everything ends up working out like it's supposed to work out and it could only happen through God. Now, we looked at the first phase last week, which was to dream, that God gives us a dream for our life and all of a sudden our eyes open up to here's what God wants to do with my life. Here's what God wants to do with me. And we start to see his plan and we start to see his purpose. And we start to see that, you know what? We're not on this earth by accident. We're on this earth on purpose. And we start to dream about what God wants to do with our lives. But a dream is worthless unless we take the next step. You see, we've got to move away from dreaming about it and start doing it. And so this is phase two. And the decision-making phase in life. Now, let me tell you something. In America... We love our leaders decisive. I mean, we like them to operate out of a, out of a, away from the bubble of chaos. And we like them to be well thought out, well studied. Let's not throw our opinions out as law. Let's just, let's, let's, let's do this and then let's make a decision and go for it. Because we think that true decisive leaders can make the decisions that need to be made as soon as they as soon as they come across them. But quickness isn't really an important matter. You know, it's much easier to make a quick decision than it is to make a good decision. And so it, it takes nothing at all to make a quick decision. It takes a lot of wisdom to be able to make the right decision. Now, the Bible has a lot to say about decision making. Look at James chapter 1, verses 7 through 8. By the way, if you want to pause this, Please pause this and uh, and go to the website westburycoc.com and go to the go to the the tab that says outlines and bulletins and uh, and and click on that and download the outline for tonight. Especially if you have a dream of what you want to do in your life. Now it doesn't matter where you are in your life, whether you're just starting, whether you're at halftime, or whether you're whether you're in the two minute warning. Uh, at the end of the game, it doesn't matter where you are. You can always chase God's dreams. You're never too old to do that. James chapter 1, verses 7 through 8 says, A person unable to make up his mind and is undecided in all that he does must not think he'll receive anything from the Lord. King James Version says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So the Bible says being double-minded is disastrous. It, it, you know, the indecision is one of those things that keeps us from God's best. It says, don't let that person think they're going to receive anything from the Lord because if I can't make up my mind about what's really important in life, then I'm limiting God. 
and I'm never going to grow in my character. You see, our decisions determine our destiny. Our choices determine our character, whether our character is developed or destroyed. See, when we have a dream, when God has placed something on our heart, when God has said, here's what I want to do through you, we've got to move on to the second phase. We've got to learn, we've got to figure out how to make the right decision. You see, God gave Moses the dream of leading the children of Israel out of 400 years of slavery in Egypt. But Moses had to make the decision to confront Pharaoh. Uh, God gave Noah the dream of saving the world from a flood. But Noah had to make the decision to build the ark like God told him to. God gave Abraham the dream of building and making a brand new nation. Abraham had to make the decision to leave everything he had, to leave all of his comfort, all of his security, and go out to the, the unknown. Now, here's the deal. We will never face the true dream of God in our lives until we get past the stage of decision makings. And the Bible is full of examples of the effect of wise decisions. Now, I want us to illustrate the importance of decision making because we tend to make decisions very frivolously. And I want to give you a biblical sample, a working plan, simple, easy to do on how to make biblical decisions, whether it's your career or who you're going to marry or how to stay married or finances or health or kids. There are principles in God's word on how to make wise decisions. So how do we make wise decisions? Number one, step one, and that is to pray for guidance. See, before we do anything else, Let's get God's perspective on the issue, Proverbs 28, 16. A man is foolish to trust himself, but those who use God's wisdom are safe. Now, I don't want to see your hands on this, but how many of you guys have ever made a stupid decision, but at the time you made the decision, you thought it was the, it was the, the best decision to make? You see, we all get impressions, but they're just that. They're impressions. They're not from God. It could be from it could be from what we ate last night. Uh, it, it, you know, I, I had something yesterday that upset my stomach, and uh, and, and so okay, I, I'm going to make you know. Did it bother me all through the day? Yes, that didn't come from God. That came from inside me. It was something I ate that wasn't good, and, and so and so you get ideas that pop into your mind. And we've got to have something greater than, well, my gut tells me, my intuition tells me, I think that this is the right thing. We need to base our decision on absolute truth. So we need God's guidance. He says the peace that Christ gives is to guide you in the decisions you make. That's what the Bible says. So ask, what does God want? Not what do I want, what does God want? Get the facts, number two. Step two, get the facts. This is, how we, this is how we turn the, the dream stage into the decision-making stage. Get the facts. You see, there's no contradiction between faith and facts. So we need to find out everything we can find out before we make a decision. Proverbs 13, 16. Every prudent man acts out of knowledge. So get the facts. Proverbs 18, 13 says uh, it, it's, uh, it, it's stupid to decide before knowing the facts. Did you know, according to the Small Business Administration, and I checked this out before, uh, before I recorded this, that 80% of all new businesses fail within the first year. 80%, 8 out of 10, fail within the first year, especially restaurants, just because of the competition and, and all that kind of stuff. What it doesn't tell you is that you look five years down the road, and of those 20% that make it, 80% of that will not last five years. So why? Well, I think it's because they're based on what I call uneducated enthusiasm. Now, they've got a great idea. They just don't have the facts. That's why a lot of marriages fail. They're based on uneducated enthusiasm. Ugh. So what do I need to know before I make this decision? That's the question we've got to ask God. Then number three is ask for advice. And that is, talk to somebody who's made a similar decision, and then talk to friends who know your weaknesses and your strengths, 
and ask for advice. Proverbs 24, 6 says the more advice you get, the more likely you are to win. You know, Henry Ford, who founded the Ford Motor Company, was asked one time, what is the secret of success? And he thought about it for a few minutes, and he said, wise decisions. And he was asked a little later on by this person that asked him that question, how do you learn to make wise decisions? And he said, from making dumb decisions. So how do we get experience in making the right decisions? Well, we get that experience from making stupid decisions. It's wise to learn from experience. It is much smarter to learn from somebody else's experience. So ask for advice. I don't have time. You don't have time to learn everything there is to learn from personal experience. Life's too short to learn everything by trial and error. You know, I don't have to look at certain sins and know that they're bad for me. I can see the result of those sins in other people's lives. So if we can learn from somebody else's successes, we can also learn from somebody else's failures. So if, you, if you're smart, you don't try to learn everything firsthand. You, you know, you, you, you learn from the experiences of others. See, the Bible says that we're given these things that happened in the Bible, these stories that we can learn from and that we can grow. So we learn to ask for advice. The Bible says in Proverbs 20, 28, get good advice and you will succeed. Now, the problem is that a lot of us would rather look wise than be wise. It's a whole lot easier to look like you have wisdom than to actually have wisdom. We think if we ask somebody, we're going to look like dunces. We're going to look like failures. But it's more important to be wise than it is to simply just appear wise. See, the Bible says wise people ask for advice. You know, if you can't ask for advice, then there's an ego problem. And you know, ego stands for edging God out. And so the Bible says arrogant people are stupid. And they're stupid because they are unwilling to be teachable. You see, if you can't learn, you'll never succeed in life. Every single one of us are ignorant just in different subjects. That's why we need to ask each other and to help each other out. The Bible says wisdom and humility go together. So ask for advice. Number four. Number four. Number four is this. Step four. Calculate the cost. Because every decision in life that we make has got a price tag. Even what seems to be the most insignificant decision. That every time we give a minute of our lives to something, then we're giving our lives away. And we'll never get that minute back. So that means when you give your life to something, you're giving your life for something. I, you know, I, I, you can always get more money. We used to say time is money. Uh, and, uh, and that was the most important thing. And, and no, 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 it's not. We, we can always get more money. We don't ever get any more time. See, we only have a certain amount of days in our lives, and every day has a price tag. Every decision we make is going to cost us time, money, energy, reputation, talents, and resources. So there's always an investment to be made. Proverbs 20, 25 says, It is a trap for man to dedicate something rashly, only later to consider his vows. He says, It's a trap to make a decision without first deliberating, to make a promise without first pondering to make the commitment and to go with what it's going to cost. It's okay when people pressure us to make a decision for us to say to them, you know what, I'm going to get back to you. If they, if they high pressure you, you have my permission to say, my preacher said, I don't let anybody high pressure me into a sale, okay? So say, I get, say you'll, tell them you'll get back to them. It's not as important that we make a quick decision as it is that we make the correct decision. You know, you know, we say this when people come to Westbury and consider being baptized, that, that we don't pressure people to give their lives to Christ, especially the very first time they ever hear the gospel. You see, we tell them, look, you take the time to make the right decision. Folks, there are two ways to open an egg. One is to crack it on the side of the skillet and put it in the frying pan. The other way is to leave it under the hen. Now, here's the difference between the two. Both of them get the egg open, but one of them leads to life, and the other one leads to death. 
And so it's always a trap to make a decision without first considering, what's this decision going to cost me? You see, let me give you a rule of life. In fact, I want you to write this down someplace. This is the point where I says, if you don't get anything else out of this, please get this. Anything in life, it's always easier to get in than it is to get out. Okay? It's easier to get in a relationship than it is to get out of a relationship. It's easier to get into debt than it is to get out of debt. It's easier to fill our schedule than to fulfill our schedule. So we calculate it's always easier to get in than it is to get out. Jesus says, no man builds something without first taking the time to consider how much it's going to cost. He says, no king goes to war unless he counts the soldiers first to make sure he's got enough soldiers to win. So ask, is it worth it? H.L. Uh, Hunt um, of the Hunt Brothers, uh, one of them that um, used to own a team in the American, back in the old American Football League, says, there are only two decisions to make in them. There are only two keys to success in life. One, decide what you really want. And two, decide what you're willing to pay for. Because there is a price tag for every decision we make, which leads us to step five. And step five is prepare for problems. You know, wise people say, I prepare, I expect the best, but I prepare for the worst. And so in faith, expect the best. I mean, even, you know, expect God to work in your life, but also be prepared for the problems that are coming. 5,000 years ago, Solomon said, Proverbs 22, 3, a sensible man watches for problems ahead and prepares to meet them. The simpleton never looks and suffers the consequences. So the wise person recognizes there are going to be problems in any decision and then prepares for those things. Even the Bible understands Murphy's Law. If it can go wrong, it will. I saw a bumper sticker one time that said Murphy was an optimist, uh, which I, don't, I would love to sit down and figure that out. So we cannot ignore problems because problems do not ignore us. See, problems are inevitable. Problems are a part of life. So we need to ask, what can go wrong with this? What will happen if it goes wrong? You see, there's a difference between preparing for a problem and then solving the problem. A big difference. So never confuse the decision-making phase with the problem-solving phase. You know, there are two different things. Because if we have to solve all the problems before we make the decision, we'll be paralyzed to the point where we can't make the decision. Now, in the spiritual realm, this means you don't have to have all of your doubts about Christianity and Christ settled before you make the decision to be baptized into Christ. Now, if somebody had told me this, that, that, that I would probably have to make my decision to follow Christ uh, much, much sooner. If somebody would have just told me that, that I did not have to have all of my doubts figured out before I said yes to Jesus Christ. That, that the rest of our life will be working out all the problems and the doubts. Let me just tell you something. I, I, I'm in the process of reading the Bible through again. I've read the Bible through cover to cover many, many times. And I'm going to tell you something. There's still a lot about God's Word that I do not understand. A man once came to Jesus and said, I need you to heal my son. And Jesus said, do you believe I can heal it? And the man says, I want to believe, but I want you to help me with my unbelief. Jesus says, you know what, that's good enough for me. And he healed the child. Now, if it's good enough for that guy, it's good enough for us. You see, you come and you say, Jesus, I want to give you everything that I have in my life. I don't understand. I've got some doubts. But I'm coming and I've got some fears. And I want you to know I'm coming to you and I'm putting all of them out on the table. I'm going to solve the problems later. See, if we had to solve all the problems of life before we made the decision to become a Christian, then where's the faith in that? There's no faith in that. I mean, those of you that are involved in business know that there are problems in every decision. So the decision maker in the business that we have needs to learn how to trust God in spite of the problems. You see, the fear of failure is a universal fear that none of us get over. Which brings us to step number six. And step number six is to face your fears. Now let me just tell you, the, the root of most of our indecision is fear. 
It's the fear we're going to make a mistake. It's the fear we're going to fail. It's the fear we're going to embarrass ourselves. It's the fear of making a commitment that we can't keep. It's the fear that somebody will laugh at us or reject us. And that makes us indecisive. We don't like to admit that we're afraid, so we make excuses. Moses said, when God said, I want you to lead my people out of captivity, Moses said, I, I don't talk so well. Evidently, he had a speech impediment. Gideon said, I'm too young. Abraham said, I'm too old. So what's our excuse for not following Jesus Christ with everything we've got and following our dream? You see, God has a thought-out plan for each and every one of our lives, and Jesus Christ wants to be a part of that plan. Now, I can hear some of you, and some of you are saying, well, hang on a second. I don't have the time. I don't have the money. I don't have the experience. I don't have the education, and I don't have the contacts. And you go to any business seminar, and they're going to tell you, you've got to have those five things in order to make it. You know, and so we go, you know, if only I were married. If only I were not married. If only I were older or younger, or if I only lived in another country, or if I could have just been born 10 years earlier or 10 years later. And it's fear that keeps us from making the decisions that God wants us to make. Ecclesiastes 11.4. If you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. You see, perfectionism paralyzes potential. God's always used imperfect people in imperfect situations to get his will done. Always. Every time. You know, that means if you're waiting for that perfect person to come along, they ain't coming. That means if you're waiting for that perfect person or that perfect relationship to be just right before you really get committed to Christ, it's not going to happen. So the basic commitments in life must be made in the middle of the stuff of life. Life goes on. So what's the antidote to fear? Faith. Faith's the antidote to fear. You, you, you know that, that Romans 8.31 says, If God be for us, who can be against us? So we trust God, and we start moving toward making that dream a reality. Now, in spite of the problems and the fears and the doubts, the secret is to move against the fear and do the things we fear the most. You see, if we know God's will, and if we know, if we know our dream is God's will, and we make the decision, and we move against our fears, and if we're one of the children of Israel, we watch those Red Sea lanes open, and we watch the manna be provided, and we watch God do the miracle in that relationship, in that problem, in your finances, whatever it is, because when I don't have the faith to do something, I go ahead and do it as though I've, I had the faith to, to do it anyway, and then I get faith. Let me give you a quote from a great theologian, okay, uh, by the name of Theodore Geisel. You might know him as Dr. Seuss. He says this. Did I ever tell you about the young Zod who came to two signs in the fork of the road? He looked one way and then the other way too. And so the Zod had to make up his mind on what to do. Well, the Zod scratched his head and his chin and his pants. And he said to himself, I'll be taking a chance. If I go to place one, that place may be hot. How will I know if I like it or not? On the other hand, though, I'd feel such a fool if I go to place two and find it, it's cool. In that case, I may catch a chill and turn blue. And so place one may be the best and not place two. On the other hand, if place one is too high, I might get a terrible earache and die. On the other hand, though, if place, place two is too low, I, got, I may get some terrible pain in my toe. So place one may be the best, he started to go. He stopped and said, on the other hand, though, on the other hand, other hand, other hand, though, and for 36 and one half hours, that Zod made starts and made stops at the fork in the road, saying, no, take a chance. You might not be right. 
Then he got an idea that was wonderfully bright. Play safe, cried the Zoe. I'll play safe, I've no dunce. I'll simply start off to both places at once. And that's how the Zoad, who could not take a chance, got to no place at all with the split in his pants. <laughs> now, what decision do we need to make? Because I'm going to implore you. I'm going to beg you. Do something great in your life for Jesus' sake. Don't waste one minute of your life. Don't live and settle for mediocrity. Don't just exist. Make the decisions that are going to determine our destiny. Now, there are four life-changing decisions that every single one of us has to come in contact with. Number one is this, the decision to commit my life to Christ and to become a part of his family. I'm just going to tell you something. There are some really good congregations of the Lord's church out there. So we need to commit our life to Christ. And if we haven't done that, then what are we waiting on? Because not to decide is to decide, number two, to make a decision to commit to the habits that are going to help me grow spiritually. You see, the result of the, the, other, the other way is that we end up being wishy-washy, lukewarm, shallow Christians. So go, go, be who God wants you to be. Squeeze out of life every ounce of that God wants us to squeeze out of life. And then number three, to use my talents, gifts, abilities, all those things in serving God and others. I say that to say that we've got good folks who are sitting on the bench. And you know what? It's time to get a mitt and get in the game. And then number four, to share Jesus Christ with others. You see, once we know the good news, we become ambassadors. We become carriers. We become messengers. I'm going to tell you, you want to know what drives Westbury Church Christ? Those four commitments right there. We are here to help you grow and to make sure you grow after you made those decisions. You say, well, somebody tell me what to do. No, I can't make those decisions for you. I can't run your race. I can't walk your walk. That's why God made you. If you're not you, who's going to be you? So there we have it. Making wise decisions. Let's pray. Our God, in your greatness, you made us. And you made us in your image. And we're so happy that you sent your son to die for us. Father, to pay for the sins that we have committed and are committing and will commit. So, Father, give us the strength to not continue in sin and therefore take advantage of your grace. Father, keep us close to you. When we fall, you promised us an advocate, your Holy Spirit, to pick us up and keep us moving. And so, with all thanks, we give you this prayer and we ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys have a good week, okay? God bless you. Bye.